Okay, just wait a few minutes until everybody joins, everybody joins the meeting. You can see the numbers ticking up as well, exciting. Okay, the number of participants is ticking up at an exponential rate here, so I'm just going to wait another few seconds before we kick off just so everybody can join and get connected and so on. All right, okay, that's looking relatively stable. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mitchell Lennon. I am a lecturer in international environmental law uh, at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, and I'm also a researcher at the One Ocean Hub. So um, a very warm welcome from me uh, and on behalf of the rest of the panellists to the webinar today. Uh, the title of today's webinar is on clarifying state species to protect the ocean from climate impacts through a human rights lens. Um, and just to buy, by way of a kind of short background for today's webinar, it's something that's purpose and so on. Um, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, uh, or the ITLOS, has been requested to clarify uh, to render an, an advisory opinion to clarify states' obligations under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, with respect to, to climate change. Um, and now to, to support the kind of the work of the tribunal and, and, and also to help kind of uh, researchers and, and members of the public to, to kind of understand um, uh, what is going on in the process and to support the work uh, of many of the experts that are involved in this process, uh, the one with Ocean Hub, uh, Greenpeace International, uh, the Centre for International Environmental Law, Client Earth, uh, and also Opportunity Green um, have organised today's webinar um, with the aim of just discussing the key points raised in their respective written submissions to, to ITLOS. Um, and the focus really today is, is kind of the particular relevance um, of international human rights law and international biodiversity law, and indeed biodiversity science, um, to uh, interpret states' obligations to protect and preserve the the marine environment from the effects of climate change. Uh, so we're really looking forward to engaging with legal and scientific expertise today. Um, uh, all of the organisations that I've listed have, have submitted a, a written statement to, to at loss and, and the plan today really is to kind of go over the key points of that. So, so without further ado, because we have no less than seven speakers today, including myself, um, we're going to turn to uh, Ian Fry, who is a special rapporteur on human rights and climate change. Um, now, Ian couldn't make it today uh, due to kind of time zone constraints and so on, so he's very kindly recorded a message for us. Um, so that's about 10 minutes long. So we're going to play that just now and uh, just sort of set the scene. Um, and then the rest of the presentations will be live, OK? Um, so if you want to sit back, relax and enjoy that, um, and we'll can play the video. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ian Fry, and I'm the Special Rapporteur for the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights in the Context of Climate Change. Three Special Rapporteurs, the Healthy Environment, Toxics and Climate Change, with the strong support from the Vance Centre for International Justice and Millbank Law Firm in the US, prepared an amicus brief for the ITLOS advisory opinion. Briefly in our amicus, we note that UNCLOS, international human rights law and international environmental law, while addressing distinct areas of international law, share common purposes that are particularly relevant to the questions proposed to the tribunal. We argue that UNCLOS should be interpreted through an approach which systemically integrates international human rights and international environmental law. This approach is required by the plain text of UNCLOS and by the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Some specific elements of our brief note that greenhouse gas emissions amount to pollution of the marine environment under UNCLOS. They threaten a range of human rights, inter alia rights to life, self-determination, home, privacy and family life, a clean, healthy and sustainable environment, food, livelihood and culture. These threats are compounded uh, for vulnerable populations, including indigenous peoples, small island states and coastal communities. States have obligations to respect, protect and fulfil rights 
where threats to such rights are foreseeable and serious. This threshold is met by pollution of the marine environment through greenhouse gas emissions. We note states' response, responses to climate change, including mitigation, adaptation, and financing measures, must be consistent with human rights standards, includes, including those derived from the right to benefit from the progress of science, otherwise known as the right to science. Wealthy and high emitting states must rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions in line with the principle of prevention and human rights obligations, including the right to science. States must implement measures that comply with international rules, standards, and recommended practices and procedures promulgated by the competent international organizations regarding activities that may result in pollution of the marine environment through greenhouse gas emissions. States must develop and implement international rules, standards, and recommended practices and procedures to ensure the full enjoyment of human rights by individuals and communities affected by climate change. States must apply the precautionary principle to activities that may result in pollution of the marine environment through greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> States must comply with international human rights law and international environmental law in the application of mitigation adaptation measures regarding activities that may result in pollution of the marine environment through greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> and finally, states must provide appropriate remedies for the violation of protected human rights from the activities that result in the pollution of the marine environment through greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> we go on to say that several UNCLOS provisions make express reference to relevant areas of international environmental law. For example, Articles 207, 212 and 213 require that states incorporate and refer to international agreed rules and standards when adopting legislation to prevent reduce and control pollution of the marine environment. Additionally, Article 237 provides that UNCOS <coughs> provisions do not override specific obligations assumed by states under marine environment related special conventions and agreements. Similarly, several UNCLOS provisions impose obligations on state parties that require consideration of applicable international human rights law. The definition, definition of pollution of the marine environment in Article 1, subparagraph 4, includes consideration of hazards to human health. Articles 98 and 146 impose duties on states to protect human life, both on the high seas and in the context of activities taken place in the seabed ocean floor and ocean subsoil. Articles 73, 230 and 282, which codify safeguards for individual fishers or polluters, prohibit imprisonment or other forms of corporal punishment for fisheries, fisheries violations, limit penalties to fines and require that states that arrest and detain any foreign fishing vessels promptly notify the flag, flag state of the ships and release the crew upon posting of a reasonable bond or other financial security. Just as UNCLOS should be inter interpreted consistently with other fields of law, so too should international human rights law be interpreted harmoniously with international environmental law. This systemic approach has been clearly spelt out by the Human Rights Committee. In its recent, recent General Comment 36 on Article 6 on the right to life of the, uh, of the Convention on the Civil and Political Rights, the committee observed that environmental degradation, climate change and unsustainable development constitute some of the most pressing and serious threats to the ability of present and future generations to enjoy the right to life. <clears throat>
<coughs> obligations of states parties under international law should thus inform the content of Article 6 of the Covenant and the obligations of states parties to respect and to ensure the right to life should also inform their relevant obligations under international environmental law. Drawing from the reports of the International Law Commission in 2006, it is our view that the texts of UNCLOS and the Vienna Convention and the jurisprudence of ITLOS, the UNCLOS Annex 7 tribunals, and the UN Human Rights Committee are all augur in favour of incorporating international human rights law as well as international environmental law when determining state obligations under UNCLOS. This holistic approach avoids fragmentation of international law. The preferred interpretive approach is one of systemic integration, which requires determining the price, precise relationship between two or more rules and principles that are both valid and applicable in respect of a particular situation. We also draw on the work of the IPCC in which it has reported extensively on the adverse impacts of climate change on the marine environment. Sea levels are rising, endangering coastal communities with floods, salinization, storm surges, and erosion. Sea level rise is an ex existential threat to many communities, threaten both communal and national self-determination, especially in low-lying and small island developing states. We note that while climate, the climate crisis including its pollution of the marine environment, threatens the human rights of all citizens globally. It disproportionately impacts the human rights of individuals and communities in vulnerable situations. It is well established that marginalized and vulnerable populations, including children, women, indigenous peoples, racial and ethnic minorities, migrants, refugees, internally displaced persons, informal settlers, persons in detention, persons in situation of homelessness, peasants, fisher folk, persons with disability and older persons bear a disproportionate brunt of environmental harm. We also note that the IPCC has documented the impact of climate change on fisheries and fishing communities. Pollution of the marine environment caused by greenhouse gas emissions compromises access to food. Fisheries, shellfish and seaweed are a major source of nutrition for many individuals and communities, including vulnerable communities reliant on non-commercial fishing or customary fishing rights. We reference Billy versus Australia, in which the UN Human Rights Committee concluded that Australia had failed to satisfy its obligations under Article 27 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples by failing to protect Indigenous Torres Strait Islanders against the effects of rising sea levels. We conclude by saying that the oceans are an integral element of the global climate system. The obligations established in UNCLOS for the protection of the marine environment directly concern the global climate crisis. The protection of the marine environment is critical to effectively address the climate emergency and the wide range of human rights whose fulfillment is dependent on healthy oceans. I thank you for watching. Great, excellent stuff for me, and they're really setting the scene on the kind of importance of human rights there, and um, in the context of uncost obligations, and 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 the great to see the human rights of science as well, kind of reflected in that. Um, so next up, actually, we have me. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen, um, and the title of my presentation today is on the role of fisheries uh, and marine biodiversity in the ocean climate nexus. Uh, so, so, so this is based on, on, on research conducted with the One Ocean Hub uh, and has been kind of put together 
and it's better with you in the International Journal of Marine and Coastal Law. Um, and, and I'll post a link to that uh, just shortly after after my presentation, okay? Um, so we're aware that, uh, that the ocean, uh, both as a physical body of water um, and the biodiversity within it play a key role in regulating the global climate um, and slowing climate change, okay? And so that's what we understand as, uh, as what we call the ocean climate nexus, okay? So we've known about the climate impacts on the ocean since the 1990s, uh, and that was with the first kind of original uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change report um, that kind of launched the negotiation process for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and of course, this kind of came to a head then in 2019 with this special report on uh, the ocean and cryosphere and a changing, and a changing climate. And, and, and that really um, it kind of outlined the key three impacts of climate change on the ocean, and those are warming, uh, ocean warming, of course, ocean acidification, um, and loss of oxygen. Um, and now one of the key kind of takeaways, uh, you know, from our research and, and what we're trying to get across in our submission to the ETLOS is, is that the ocean and its biodiversity also functions as a carbon sink and, and plays a key role in the global carbon cycle and therefore the cycle of the climate. Um, so about a quarter of anthropogenic CO2 is, is locked in into the ocean in one way or another. Um, the question of sequestration of carbon um, uh, by the ocean happens at all levels. Okay, so so both of the ocean as a physical body of water at the surface, uh, sequestration by by plankton and zooplankton. Um, this happens at the surface, the the seabed, and across across all marine ecosystems. Um, this is done by by plankton, by fish. Um, also by marine mammals and and, 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 and and marine plants such as macroalgae and mangroves and so on. And they all play an important role in sequestering carbon carbon from the atmosphere. Um, uh, now, the kind of topic that's on everybody's lips, uh, kind of UNFCCC negotiations, is blue carbon. So most of you will have, um, will have heard of that. Um, so blue carbon refers to carbon captured by coastal marine ecosystems. So this includes things like salt marshes, and sea grass meadows uh, and of course mangroves as well. Um, but 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 they don't only provide um, or only function as a carbon sink. They also provide other key ecosystem services. Okay, so that could be coastal protection from extreme weather events and sea level rise. Um, they're also very rich in biodiversity, um, and they provide nursery sites for fish um, uh, and other and other species. Um, and the importance of, of 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 blue carbon ecosystems and, and coastal carbon ecosystems is um has been reflected in the intergovernmental panel on climate change's sort of wetland supplement um for greenhouse gas emissions and that was produced in in, in 2006 and that covers both sea grasses mangroves um uh, and uh, uh, and also salt marshes as well. And then one of the things that I find interesting, at least in participating in uh, the ocean climate dialogue so far, is that although some states have already included the restoration and protection of, of blue carbon ecosystems in their nationally determined contributions, um, many states have not heard of this wetland supplement and certainly don't make use of it. Um, so yeah, and and so 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 since most of you will be familiar with blue carbon, I'd like to really focus on the kind of role of the of the open ocean and and um, uh, and that's important as, as a carbon sink. Okay, so so we've kind of focused here on, on this graph and kind of what they call trophic cascade carbon, which is in coastal areas, um, and things like damaging fishing practices such as trawling and things that disturb the seabed um, uh, can, can can release uh, carbon into the atmosphere and limit um, coastal blue carbon functioning. Okay, um, and then many of you will kind of heard of, heard of the whale pump as well, and the importance of kind of whale poo uh, with uh, and kind of sequestering carbon into the deep sea, um, as well as kind of uh, what we call kind of bony fish carbonate as well as a carbon sink. And so you find this with with healthy managed tuna fisheries and so on, where um, the functioning of, of of fish and kind of larger pelagic species such as tuna actually. Uh, as a very efficient way to store carbon, mainly because uh, uh, their poo sinks a lot faster to the seabed if, uh, if I can put it in those terms. 
Um, and and so just I think the final the, the main one I want to focus on is something that you might have not might not have heard of, okay, which is uh, which is understood as kind of twilight zone carbon, okay, or mesopelagic carbon. So I have a dedicated slide for that. Um, and this is to do with the kind of meso mesopelagic zone, which some of you may have heard of and some of you might not. So that's that's two two hundred to to one thousand meters below the sea surface, okay. So uh, so this is the mes mesopelagic zone here. Um, and it's home to this very diverse range of, of, of fish species. So both the hapsic fishes, okay, which is here, uh, and the lantern fishes as well. So these sort of weird and wonderful and almost kind of scary looking uh, fish species. So they're, in fact, one of the most kind of abundant groups of, of vertebrates um, uh, in the environment. However, we've got very, very limited knowledge on these. Um, and what they do is they perform something called deal vertical migration. Okay. Uh, and what that means is that they surface at night. Uh, and they feed on plankton, okay, and then they return to the mesopelagic zone um, during the day. Um, and that process happens every single day, day in, day out, and has been for millions of years. And so um, it's, it's absolutely vital in the process of kind of locking up uh, CO2 into the deep sea, okay? So they, they lock carbon and they sink it to the deep ocean through this process that they do every day. So therefore, they're a vital component um, and both in carbon cycling and a, and a kind of key component in the ocean climate nexus. Okay, and so they um, they kind of participate in what we would call the biological pump. Okay, so this is all well and good. You know, this functioning of this is is excellent. However, there is an issue here with a kind of emerging industrial mesopelagic fishery. Okay, um, and the reason that these fish are in demand uh, is partly for for, uh, for 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 food security, as some might argue. Um, but there's also a demand for fish oil, and that's used in kind of animal and aquaculture feed, and also in pharmaceuticals and so on. Um, however, we know very little about the population dynamics of these fish fishes, and, and, and although they may be they may be high in abundance, we're not sure of their recovery potential and so on. So there's lots of uncertainty on the science here. Um, however, we do know that maintaining healthy populations of these fish species is, is important for carbon sequestration and, and so there are there are kind of growing uh, calls for a, a moratorium or a precautionary pause which seems to be the new parlance um on mesopelagic fishing okay so it's one of the uh, one of the kind of key findings in our research and we've highlighted that um in our submission to the outlaws okay um and 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 the kind of key, key takeaways that, that we've included in our submission really are that you know healthy fisheries and, and marine biodiversity protection and preservation are um, important as because they're components of the global carbon cycle and they're integral to uncost obligations um, and, and climate change. Um, and then further to that, the protection and restoration of fish and other marine vertebrate populations to, to healthy levels, you know, should um, be considered as a key kind of both in nature-based climate mitigation option. Um, and that's thanks to, as I said already, this kind of greater capacity for carbon storage than, than some coastal and blue carbon ecosystems. Um, and indeed, so, so how do you put that into practice? What, what, what do states need to do? And, and from a policy perspective, we, we've argued that kind of reduction of wider pressures on blue carbon ecosystems through you know, climate smart MPAs and marine spatial planning, but also ecosystem restoration and habitat restoration ahead of um, these technological fixes that, that, that we're very uncertain of. Um, and of course, uh, on top of including blue carbon within uh, coastal blue carbon within states and NDCs, we'd like to see more um, inclusion of kind of uh, fisheries resilient uh, climate resilient fisheries management within states NDCs so they can be they can be accounted for. Um, so that was just a very short presentation from me. Um, I'll say thank you very much, Mitchell, since I am the chair. Um, and we're going to turn now to Professor Elisa Mordera, who is the uh, uh, kind of principal investigator for the One Ocean Hub. Uh, so Elisa, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, loud and clear. I, will, uh, I will complement Mitchell's presentation. I've worked very closely over the years um, on this topic, also in preparing the, our own submissions to ITLOS and the special issue that he mentioned, and very much trying to bring together um, the latest understanding from colleagues work, working across marine sciences and what they know about the role of biodiversity um, in the context of the global carbon cycle. 
uh, and then reflecting on how much has already been clarified in terms of the relevance and applicability of international biodiversity law at the ocean climate nexus, and to what extent that also supports the point made by Special Rapporteur Fry around the relevance and importance of protecting marine biodiversity and the marine environment more broadly conceived also for with a view to protecting human rights. And I guess the key uh, one of the key points we made in our in our submission is really that of first of all um, appreciating fully the relevance of the Convention on Biological Diversity and its text and its obligations um, for that uh, systemic integration. Um, with uh, obligations under UNCLOS uh, in the light of you know, uh, the uh, rules on treaty interpretation. Um, and I think what's really important here is that not only we have um, a regime that is very much compatible with UNCLOS and is already very much um, considered as such in other areas of protection of the marine environment, uh, but also a regime where we have a significant amount of state practice. We have 196 state parties that have over time already addressed that nexus between the ocean, biodiversity and climate change. And in fact, have done so also taking into account human rights uh, to a certain extent, even if sometimes uh, without using human rights terminology. And so maybe a, a critical starting point, we hope in supporting ECLOS work in, in um, consolidating and clarifying that interpretation across relevant regimes is taking stock of the fact that 196 state parties have already identified biodiversity and ecosystem functions and as services as contributing significantly to climate change mitigation and adaptation, including in the context of disaster risk reduction. In addition, climate change itself has been Consider both from a science perspective and a legal perspective as the potentially the major or certainly one of the significant drivers of global biodiversity lot, loss uh, and a driver that exacerbates the other drivers, uh, over exploitation uh, and pollution, for instance. But I think critically also, there's been a recognition time and again under the CBD that certain climate change responses, be that mitigation or adaptation, can themselves threaten and damage biodiversity and in fact have had also negative impact on human rights. So we already have a body of um, state practice on those key points and, um, and it is already possible in light of this um, uh, basic understanding to then read the basic obligations under the, com uh, the Convention on Biological Diversities as requiring specific um, actions by uh, at least CBD um, parties that are also parties to UNCLOS and uh, the climate change regime, uh, including the point of integrating biodiversity uh, and marine biodiversity in climate change plans and programs and policies, and the other way around, the importance of impact and strategic assessments, um, but also the identification of regu and regulation of climate change related processes and activities that may affect biodiversity, including marine biodiversity um, and many other more specific aspects related to say uh, invasive alien species or the incentives, uh, which can include for instance, um, fisheries subsidies um, in relation to the ocean climate nexus. Uh, but crucially what the CBD has done is also paying particular attention to some of those um, communities that are most affected by climate change, particularly at the ocean climate nexus, and very much building on the recognition of indigenous and local knowledge, and also the, ne the necessity to protect and respect uh, customer sustainable use. And through that, uh, elaborating again, time and again, on important safeguards in relation to consent, to prior assessments of potential impacts, and to fairly and equitably sharing benefits that may arise from mitigation and adaptation, which has also been captured uh, in the UN framework principles on human rights and the environment. And many other international and regional human rights processes have recognized this um, contribution of the CBD to the protection of those human rights. I think equally something that is often uh, not paid sufficient attention uh, is also the importance of the very detailed guidance that again, 196 parties have carefully negotiated and agreed by consensus at the ocean climate nexus uh, under the CBD. Now that those CBD decisions are formally non-binding, but they are, uh, I think, widely regarded as um, subsequent practice and relative interpretative ma materials in as far as the CBD is concerned. 
uh, but also under those unclosed provisions that connect with other international regimes. Uh, they can be seen as generally accepted, accepted international regulations. And at the very least, they can be considered good practice guidance that even for non-parties to the CBD, I think it would be hard to argue that uh, their conduct, you know, conduct below that standard would be acceptable uh, in terms of reaching relevant uh, international uh, protection goals. So I'm not going to go into the details of this, but just to give a sense of how um, the ecosystem approach, which is the cornerstone approach of the CBD, really has provided a way to look into those aspects of um, a holistic approach to climate change mitigation and adaptation, taking into account the role of biodiversity, but also the risks for biodiversity and marine biodiversity, uh, and taking into account those communities that live most closely um, with biodiversity and whose human rights are biodiversity dependent. So there's an important, again, body of interpretative material which has been intergovernmentally agreed and in some cases has received also significant inputs from uh, indigenous and local knowledge holders um, that is available to the tribunal to clarify to a very significant level of detail um, the obligations of states uh, in this connection. And maybe just to mention very briefly that while until, I guess, last year, uh, human rights language has not been used explicitly under the CBD and its decisions, there has been now wide recognition, um, particularly, I think, since also John published his report in 2017 as UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, about the essential relevance of international biodiversity law and actual state conduct that effectively protects or ensures sustainable use of biodiversity for our very basic human rights, everyone's human rights to life, health, food and water, but also then indigenous people's human rights and other biodiversity dependent communities um, with particular attention also to women's and children's rights. Uh, and again, we find that guidance, we find through that lens, uh, particular elements of CBD guidance that speak to certain human rights holders. But I think very generally, um, if we look at that uh, body of guidance, we find uh, several elements that can almost step by step guide states into taking a more holistic approach to their climate change obligations in the context of the marine environment. And so just to say that in a way, what would be crucial for, for the ITLOS advisory opinion is really giving a much clearer sense, not only of how compatible uh, this guidance is, uh, but also how, um, how clear the minimum content of state obligations is. This is a critical matter under international environmental law. We often see that the wording of treaties uh, leaves a significant margin of discretion to the point that certain states can even argue that some obligations are not actually, in fact, binding on them, but they're more of a voluntary nature. And we clearly have um, uh, maybe an even deeper conversation around the, the legally binding nature of some of the obligations under uh, or some of the content of the Paris Agreement. But I think that clarification of how each treaty um, complements each other and clarifying the minimum content of state obligations and procedural safeguards, which really come from the human rights perspective um, will provide, I think, a lot of value and clarity and sense, I think, of urgency um, across those areas of international law. Um, and um, at the very least, with the adoption at the end of last year of the Global Biodiversity Framework, which under the CBD uh, embraces uh, explicit human rights language, a human rights-based approach, as well as very clear language of, on the need to protect um, the human rights of indigenous peoples and other communities uh, is just one sign of how um, these are not novel things or groundbreaking things that have been asked of ITLOS, but in fact, um, a convergence of many decades of work and a very clear sense of, uh, of the content of those state obligations, I think, across uh, the international community of states and uh, non-state actors. Um, and I just want to conclude very briefly on that point around marine pollution and human health. Again, both biodiversity science and um, I think some of the decisions both under the CBD and the World uh, Health Organization are really showing the incredible um, depth of the human health dependence on healthy biodiversity, including healthy marine biodiversity. All uh, possible negative impacts on health are really dependent from the microbial level to the planetary level uh, to the work the biodiversity does and the benefits that it provides to us. 
Um, and so finally, I think that the key point in which we conclude in our submission to ITLUS is really that understanding of due diligence and precaution in the light of the latest biodiversity science and particularly our advancements in understanding ecosystem services as a way to um, really capture those foreseeable infringements of human rights dependent on marine biodiversity uh, that capture that connection between human rights obligations and biodiversity obligation. Um, the opportunity of the international recognition of everyone's human right to a healthy environment to think in more systemic ways about the connectivity of the ocean and life on land and the ocean, the indivisibility of human rights and, and biodiversity really helps as science and as in law to think about that uh, connections. And finally, a brief, a brief reference to the general comment of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child on children's rights to a healthy environment, which has just been released. And I think very much provides that sense of how precaution needs to be understood in a, in a temporal dimension, really thinking around the most vulnerable and how impacts on them uh, may, uh, may very much vary over time. Uh, and so really calling on states to prevent uh, even that uh, on a what uh, on a shorter scale may seem a reasonable negative impact, but in fact is unreasonable from the viewpoint of children's health, survival, development, um, because that will continue through their childhoods when par they're particularly vulnerable uh, and through their lives. So I'll stop there and uh, yeah, look forward to questions as well as connections with the other panelists. Well, super wonderful stuff, Elisa. Thank you very much. And so now we've just got we're getting a kind of short uh, intervention here from Professor John Knox, who was the former UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights and the Environment. So, and then we'll take we will take some kind of Q and A from the audience. Although I've been answering a few as we go. Um. So, John, you've got the floor. Okay. Thanks, Mitchell. Uh, thanks to you and Elisa and the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm going to have to drop off uh, because of an unavoidable school conflict I have, have here at the top of the hour, but I, I have some thoughts. So um, one aspect of this story that really strikes me is how much of it depends on the recent developments in human rights law. And I want to just kind of emphasize how recent those developments have been. The application of human rights norms to climate change has really exploded over the last 15 years in a ways that I think would have been considered wildly over-optimistic as recently as a decade ago. So remember, it was only in 2005 that the Inuit first brought a petition to an international human rights body, the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, and had the commission not even reject it, but just basically kind of return it as if it had been misdelivered. In 2007, the small island states adopted the Malay Declaration, which kind of mapped out a more step-by-step -step approach, which was followed by resolutions in the Human Rights Council on, on climate change in 2008. But the idea that there could even be a special rapporteur for climate change and human rights was, all, was still considered so controversial that a resolution to that effect wasn't even introduced. By 2015, the Paris Agreement had included references to human rights in its preamble. By 2017, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights issued a very lengthy advisory opinion on human rights um, and the environment. In 2018, at the conclusion of my mandate and the beginning of David, um, David Boyd's this, the current special rapporteur on human rights, his mandate, um, I, uh, as, as Elisa referred to, I submitted framework principles on human rights and the environment, and David and I called on the General Assembly for the first time to adopt the right to a healthy environment, to formally recognize it. At the same time, things were happening at, at the court, uh, the judicial level. So in 2019, uh, the Dutch Supreme Court issued what's still, I think, the farthest reaching decision by any tribunal domestic or international in the Urgenda case. In 2020, the Human Rights Committee issued its first decision on climate refugees in the Te Uteota case versus New Zealand. In 21, EM was appointed finally as the first special rapporteur on climate change. In 22, the General Assembly recognized the right to a healthy environment. I'm leaving out many things, but this is enough, I think, to illustrate just what an amazing development we've seen in an extremely short period of time. Part of what I'm leaving out, because it would take way too long, is just to list all of the current pending cases that are considering some aspect of a human rights approach to climate protection at the domestic level and at the international level. Perhaps the highest profile pending case is the advisory opinion request brought 
<clears throat> earlier this year to the International Court of Justice by the General Assembly at the instigation of Vanuatu. But there's another advisory opinion pending before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and there are cases pending and already argued before the European Court of Human Rights. So again, there, there's a lot going on. What I just want to say a couple of brief remarks about is, why is this? What is it about human rights norms that make it so such a fertile ground for bringing these norms to bear on climate change in particular? You could say, well, unfortunately, what's happened is that the effects of climate change on human rights have simply become clearer. And that's certainly true. But at the same time, there are other areas of international law where you might expect a similar kind of response if the main concern was simply the effects of climate change have become clearer, so a, 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 an, you know, response is now demanded. The most obvious one is international environmental law, which has not seen this kind of explosion. So what is it about human rights law in particular that's making it, in some ways, the most important body of law internationally to be brought to bear on climate change, so much so that it's, in many ways, um, I don't want to say the center of the arguments before it lost, because that would be an exaggeration, but certainly extremely relevant, as Elisa said, to trying to get it lost to recognize minimum standards that states have to meet. Well, one aspect of it is, of course, that human rights does not stay contained in a silo. Human rights law has something to say about everything that might adversely affect human rights. It infiltrates other areas of law quite easily, and it kind of demands to be taken into account. Another aspect of it is that human rights law is aspirational. So it includes standards that recognize that states haven't met them yet, but that they have obligations to try to meet them. But finally, I think maybe most important, international human rights law has the potential to evolve fairly rapidly because it has institutions and forums that don't depend on state control. And that's extremely unusual in international law. There's simply no equivalent for that in most of international environmental law. Of course, a huge exception is the ILOS uh, tribunal. The, the ability of the tribunal to construe international law in a progressive way, or simply to recognize where international law has developed without having to wait for states to agree that this is where international law now is, is a huge opportunity uh, for, the, for it laws to do what human rights tribunals have been doing now as I said, really for the last 10 or 15 years, and that is to move the ball forward, to move the ball down the field and require states to do the things that the law seems to require them to do, but that the states, for a variety of reasons, are either unwilling, unable, or simply dragging their feet towards doing. So my question, I guess, for, for Mitchell, Elisa, and the other participants, and for everyone who's thinking about this is, um, what should ITLOS's role in this process be? Um, its role is obviously primarily to interpret the UNCLOS, but how much should it take into account norms from the CBD and human rights instruments? How much is it realistic, I should say, to expect it to rely primarily on those instruments? I realize that articles like 194 of the Law of the Sea uh, of, of UNCLOS open the door to taking into account other norms. And in fact, you could say, require states and interpreters of UNCLOS to take into account those norms. How willing do we think it loss is prepared to be to actually do that, let's say, aggressively, um, as opposed to saying a few nice things in the margin? And relatedly, is there a danger that it loss might interfere with the development of these norms in other tribunals? Or to put it more positively, how can we try and push it loss, or how can we hope that it loss will actually contribute to the development of these norms, especially, for example, before the International Court of Justice? So I'll, I think I'll, I have some other questions and thoughts, but I think I'll just stop there. I think that's enough to kind of go. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much for those, John. They were really wonderful uh, reflections. And of course, if you have more, feel free to email us. That'd be great. So, um, so Elisa, I don't know if you'd like to respond to those just shortly. Um... Sure. Yeah. Well, I think, um, of the international courts who have been asked, I think, to, to clarify state obligations, I think ITLOS may be one that based on their earlier case law might be quite uh, 
um, bold in clarifying the content of those obligations. I think ITLO's jurisprudence on, on precaution, for instance, in some ways is more advanced than, than that of the ICJ. Um, and the, the Convention on the Law of the Sea lends itself to that, um, I think, systemic integration, uh, both in, in the way it is constructed, but I think in understanding the science and how we understand the protection of the marine environment entails um, that engagement with other areas of international environmental law. That, that's been done before, and I think now we're really taking a step forward, but it's not, it's not a jump. Um, so I think that there are good, um, I think it is, you know, uh, good to expect ITLOS to be quite detailed and uh, and to clarify certain matters that, again, unfortunately, but under the Convention on Biological Diversity are difficult to be addressed by states. They have avoided very carefully that clarification of minimum content of obligations. Uh, unfortunately, that's maybe even more true under the international climate change regime, where even the very same CBD parties don't haven't quite integrated and connecting those relevant decisions from the CBD into their work under the climate change regime. Um, also, I think the state of, of the science, I mean, the calls for transformative change from both the IPCC and the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services and the Global Ocean Assessments, I think they really they really show that there is, we need, you know, even for a very um, lawyerly attention to effectiveness of international law, um, call for um, a very as detailed uh, clarification of those, that minimum content of those obligations across those regimes. Um, and, and the Convention about, on, on the Law of the Sea is also in itself a very evolutive instrument. Now, maybe, maybe the question is more around how much will ITLOS relate to human rights? Um, because maybe that is something where the Convention on the Law of the Sea is less equipped. Um, but I think, again, the changes that you have mentioned, and again, the science and the evidence around the impacts on human rights are such that, and, and the entry points that exist in the Convention are sufficient uh, for the tribunal to at least uh, make a connection um, and show the, the relevance. Uh, and I think that the importance of the synergistic interpretation and application of treaties to achieve multiple uh, international objectives under also other international regimes. Um, and hopefully that sets the bar high for, for the ICJ, if not necessary to follow on the same path, but to provide um, yeah, as, as as much as possible in that context, clarifications that go beyond what the ICJ current case law has been on, on international environmental obligations. Great, thank you. Thanks, Elisa. Excellent, Elisa, thank you very much. And certainly um, s s s some excellent points there. And I think uh, I think it's gonna be very difficult for the tribunal to, to ignore indeed. So um, I'm just very conscious of time. Okay, so uh, I'm going to pass on to uh, Sebastian Diuk from the Centre for International Environmental Law. And great to have you here, Sebastian. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'll give you 10 minutes to make your presentation. Um, and of course, if you've got any Q's and E's in the question, uh, just please just uh, ask them in the Q&A function on the chat box, please. Uh, I've been answering them uh, uh, as I can, any ones that have been directed at me. Uh, but Sebastian, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And based on what uh, John um, laid out, I'd like to thank the organizer of the event, of course, but also to express our gratitude to the fellow panelists and participants uh, in this uh, event today who actually contributed to help us move forward and consolidate some of the legal norms that we are discussing today. Um, I think that's important to recognize these developments. Um, it's a challenge for me to, to summarize 40 pages of legal briefings that colleagues have um, drafted uh, for the tribunal in just 10 minutes. So I'll try to focus on a, a few elements, but maybe to just to come back to the question that uh, John um, challenged us with, I feel like one of the um, opportunity also for the tribunal and I will provide examples of that in the presentation to draw from human rights uh, case law, for instance, and from other bodies of international law is that there are principles, obligations that are not fully articulated under our own clause, but that other bodies have uh, further explored in terms of the scope, the, the exact meaning of these obligations. And so it's not that we need obligations that are outside of uh, the provisions of enclosed, but rather that the tribunal can build upon those to understand actually what 
contributes to meeting, what kind of state behavior contributes to meeting obligations and what cannot be considered as sufficient. And in that context, uh, we hope that actually the, uh, the tribunal will be finding additional strength and legitimacy in, in building uh, upon these different fields of international law. That's actually one of the main motivation for our amicus brief, actually. It's to explore and lay out how human rights bodies and international and national courts have already provided further uh, clarity on um, the extent of states' duty to protect against uh, climate harms, as we find also laid out um, in the UNCLOSE. Uh, the, the briefing that we presented jointly with Greenpeace International, and I see that you have a link in the chat, thank you, Senia, um, is tackling different aspects of a scientific basis for the advisory opinion. I will go, uh, but make only a very brief summary of this. What are the state's obligation under on clause, but also the principles that should guide the interpretation of these provisions by it laws. And then what, um, once we have defined the standard of action that's required from the states, uh, understanding on the basis of his uh, precedents and uh, statements from different authoritative bodies, what measures are actually required to fulfill these obligations, uh, to make the, to to be able to go beyond just statements of principles. The provisions of UNCLOS and particularly uh, the part 12 of the convention obviously provide a, a lot of legal basis for the the discussions, um, but I will not go so much into detail since uh, others have already um, ref refer to those. In terms of science, in the interest of time, I'm not going to unpack uh, all that has been said before, but let's just agree that the IPCC has been very unequivocal. Um, and that's maybe the added value of having these cases uh, with so many reports being published now, including the uh, report dedicated to oceans that was mentioned previously. Climate change is an anthropogenic fossil fuel global crisis that imperils the world's ocean. And that's very relevant for the mandate that ITLO should be drawing um, to, to respond to the um, request from COSIS. These reports have laid out repeatedly, together with other scientific assessment, the urgency of a climate crisis, its principal causes, the current consequences, but also the foreseeable irreparable future harms, including for the oceans and communities, depending on those. And the special rapporteur, Jan Frey, in his presentation has made the linkages then between those impacts and human rights protected under international law. So what are the obligations that UNCLOSE provide for states to uh, prevent, reduce, and control greenhouse gas emissions? It's very clear on the part 12 that all states have a general obligation on the Article 192 in particular to protect and preserve the marine environment. It, the, the arbitrary tribunals and heat laws have further unpacked the scope of these obligations, in particular, for instance, in the South China Sea arbitration, highlighting that this entails both a positive obligation, but also a negative obligation, and that both of the components are critical. And if we look into part 12 of UNCLOSE, what is uh, very explicitly laid out by the convention itself, this includes a duty for all state, for states to take all measures necessary to prevent, reduce, and control pollution um, of the marine environment. It includes uh, an extraterritorial component and the need to prevent transboundary impacts, and also the need to establish regulatory and assessment frameworks to ensure that the conduct of private actors is also um, addressed. But importantly, and this is something that I will um, explore a little bit more in my presentation, Article 194 also clarify that these measures, the measures adopted in order to prevent pollution of a marine environment, must themselves not cause harm. And these measures shall include, among others, those designed to minimize to the fullest possible extent, the release of toxic, harmful, and noxious substances and other forms of pollutions in the oceans. Um, and I will, I will come back to the importance of this particular uh, provision as we interpret uh, the, the general obligations laid out under Article 192. Very importantly, others have mentioned this, so maybe I'll just skim through this, but we have two fundamental principles that should guide the interpretations of the provision of UNCLOSE by ITLOS. The first one, obviously, is the um, principle of harmonious interpretation um, or systematic interpretation. Others have already said a lot. We find it in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. This is the opportunity for ITLOS and actually um, also the 
the legal basis for ETLOS to draw from international human rights law, from the CBD and other legal frameworks. And the second one is uh, the necessity to interpret state's duty under and close at the light of best available science, a very important principle as well. International requires states to align their climate action with the best available science. This is um, a principle that is uh, laid out uh, in part 12 of UNCLOSE that refers to the importance of state conduct being guided by best scientific evidence available. But we find this uh, general principle of law across um, many legal frameworks, including uh, the UNFCCC, international and human rights uh, frameworks. And that should be um, helping uh, states, but then also the uh, judges of ETLOS to understand actually what is required from states um, on the basis of this best available science uh, to prevent, in the context of climate related harms to uh, marine ecosystem. At the light of the best available science, um, the main message that is contained in our briefing, in our um, amicus brief, is that international environmental law and human rights law together with provisions of UNCLOS require states to act urgently to keep warming below 1.5 degrees by rapidly curbing fossil fuel related greenhouse gas emissions and by supporting adaptation and resilience. Now, once we have said that, what would be particularly important will be for ETLOS to highlight actually what this means concretely, what state behavior is required under this uh, obligation and what uh, is not sufficient for states to, to meet these obligations. And as I mentioned earlier, this is where human rights uh, precedents and international environmental frameworks are particularly helpful for us to understand beyond just this general principle uh, of prevention of harm. Best, and I, I invite you to um, uh, consult uh, the amicus brief that was submitted by Greenpeace and CL. It has been shared in the chat. Um, but based on the, the precedents that we uh, list in this amicus brief, we found different um, levels of standards for states' action. First, states must take all actions necessary to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system, including by urgently phasing out fossil fuel and through effective regulation of the conduct of private actors that contribute to foreseeable harms, including threats to human rights, to the oceans. They must also ensure that adequate adaptation measures and effective remediation of harm is available. In order to fulfill these obligations, states must rely on measures capable of adverting the risk of foreseeable harm in the near term, in line with a precautionary principle. And this is perhaps something that has become particularly important in the context of uh, the heat loss advisory opinion, but also the other uh, two advisory proceedings. Virtually no state today denies the importance of taking climate action. The question is how much should be done today? How much should be done in the short term? What policy pathways are available to states to fulfill these obligations to prevent climate harms? The precautionary principle calls for preemptive regulation of action or, sorry, preventive regulation or action when there is no conclusive evidence of a particular risk scenario. And when the risk is uncertain or when the risk is disproved. The principle is widely considered as part of customary international law, uh, including in the environmental field. International human rights bodies have un already endorsed and elaborated further on the basis of a precautionary principle, recognizing the importance of that principle and its relevance in the context of the prevention of harm, for instance, to the right to life, to other fundamental rights. So this is, provides the tribunal with a great example of how to draw from one principle of uh, provided in an international um, legal um, field uh, to another. Every fraction of additional degree of warming exacerbates impacts to the marine environment. The science is very clear about this and heightens the risk of irreversible harm. In that context, the precautionary principle requires states to urgently adopt measures capable of rapidly halting the emissions driving global warming. Failure to do so increases the likelihood of overshooting 1.5 with foreseeable catastrophic impacts. <laughs> 
Moreover, and that's the second dimension that actually is very relevant to Article 194, for instance, under the principle of precaution, states are obliged to prioritize measures that pose a lower risk of causing harm. As the IPCC and human rights authorities have recognized, measures taken in response to climate change may themselves pose risks or might threaten uh, people and the environment. And so these underscore the obligation of states to respect, promote, and consider their respective obligations in all climate action, as uh, is explicitly stated in the preamble of the Paris Agreement. In that context, technologies such as technological carbon dioxide removal or marine geoengineering present such uncertainties, feasibility constraints, and additional risks including to the marine environment. Noting that carbon dioxide removal may be ineffective in reversing temperature rise following overshoot of temperatures, and that it is unproven at scale currently, the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees of warming found that it is risky to rely on such technology to limit warming to 1.5 degree, and rather, uh, rather than on measures that drastically addresses the root causes of climate change, that is fossil fuel related uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the near term. Setting the precautionary principle, states have also expressed concern about and curtail the development and use of marine geoengineering under other international environmental treaties, decisions and resolutions under the Convention on Biological Court that have stricken down states' dependence on future measures um, that they deem that these courts and tribunals deem too speculative to justify delaying the implementation of reliable near-term action. And so this is something that will be particularly relevant. And finally, let me also uh, finish by highlighting one other important principle of international law that is also very strongly rooted in human rights law, but not only. It is the importance of um, intergenerational equity and the protection of uh, human rights of future generations. This principle of intergenerational equity demands a just balance and non-discrimination between the needs of present and future generations and the exercise of their rights. The opening words of the UN Charter reflect the duty of present generation to protect future generations. And since its adoption, the principle of intergenerational equity has been reaffirmed, elaborated, operationalized in, in foundational documents setting forth the principles of international law, but also has been increasingly cited in the context of human rights uh, litigation, including in relation to the protection of uh, the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. In relation to this, I freezed a couple of times. Well, that's contrary to the theme of the webinar today. I'm sorry for that. I hope you can hear me now. Um, I will just uh, finish very soon, but I wanted to invite you to consult the Maastricht principles that on the human rights of future generations that Senya highlighted in, in the, the chat uh, a few minutes ago. And um, the relevance of uh, this principle of intergenerational equity is particularly um, there in the context of uh, the uh, advisory uh, proceedings that we are discussing today, given the foreseeable future harms due to climate change that we have already discussed, continuing current levels of greenhouse gas emissions constitute an injustice to future generations that are perpetrated by the present generations. And so in confronting the impacts of greenhouse gas to the climate, to the environment, and hence to the uh, human rights of uh, future generations, the principles of intergenerational equity demands that decision makers pay stronger attention to the distributive consequences of climate harms. We are hoping that the tribunal will consider uh, these principles together with the best available science as summarized by the IPCC, but also other um, scientific study, and we'll be uh, concluding with very strong recommendations to really guide uh, the interpretation of states' obligations in relation to the prevention of climate harms. And the final uh, principle that is also critical, um, that is reflected in many international environmental 
frameworks that uh, ITLOS must draw from is the principle of common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities in light of different national circumstances. That will be essential to ensuring that ITLOS conclusions will be in line with uh, other international legal frameworks. And I will just conclude by highlighting that, um, as others have done, this is very important not to treat this advisory opinion as just a, a standalone um, um, uh, advi advice, um, but uh, to, to consider it in the context of these three upcoming advisory opinions. And we really hope that uh, the, the judges in ITLOS will consider these principles of harmonious interpretation and systemic interpretation, because this is also the principles that other courts will need to rely upon in order to take uh, ITLOS conclusions into account in their own proceedings. That was excellent. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And just for um, that was, that was a really, really, really interesting um, intervention. And I really enjoyed reading uh, Seals and uh, Greenpeace's uh, submission. So I'm going to turn very quickly to David Kay from Opportunity Green. Um, but David, you've got the floor. Thank you very much, Mitchell. I will just share my slides with everyone that has come through. Um, excellent. Brilliant. Thanks for the introduction. And, and yeah, I just liked it. Um, echo Sebastian's comments and and extend my thanks for the rest of the panelists, not only for the excellent presentations, but also for the excellent submissions. I think it's a great advert for the amicus brief, seeing the diversity um, and range of expertise that's been put forward to the court, which is excellent. Um, I'll give you a short introduction to Opportunity Green's submission. And if you'll forgive me for diverging momentarily from the human, life, human rights focus of today's webinar. Um, I've nevertheless been invited to, to share um, our submission, which focused instead on the climate impacts of international shipping. Um, and I, I suppose there are two key reasons for us adopting that focus. And the, the first is it the, the expertise we have as, uh, uh, to, as amicus. So, um, international shipping regulation is an area of expertise for us, particularly my colleagues who work with climate vulnerable countries at the International Maritime Organization. And second, because of the importance of international shipping, uh, its vital importance to climate change and indeed the ocean, um, is currently responsible for nearly 3% of global emissions. And without action, that could rise to 10 to 13% within a few decades. And because the sector is big and difficult and international, states are reluctant to regulate it. So the international legal obligations of states are therefore crucial to addressing the climate impact of the industry. So the key argument advanced by our submission is that UNCLOS requires states to adopt international regulations on shipping emissions, which are in line with the Paris Agreement. And to the extent that those international regulations are insufficient, states can and should regulate unilaterally or regionally to discharge their obligations. Um, I will very briefly um, take you through this slide because I'm aware others have, have already dis discussed it, but the, the starting point for our analysis is the general and specific obligations to, related to vessel pollution in part 12 of the UNCLOS. So the two general obligations you can see there on screen broadly track the two COSIS questions. So we've got the duty to protect and preserve the marine environment under 192, and the obligation to take all necessary measures to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment under Article 194. Those general obligations are then supplemented in subsequent articles, which includes, for our purposes, 211, which is pollution from vessels, and 212, pollution from or through the atmosphere. So leaving aside the general 192 obligation for a moment, the other three articles all apply to pollution of the marine environment, which is a defined um, in UNCLOS. So like other submissions, the first place our analysis started was to um, establish that greenhouse gas emissions fall squarely within that definition. Um, so on its face, the greenhouse gas emissions satisfy each element of that definition, which is set out on the slide you can see now. So they are caused by humans. They directly or indirectly introduce substances or energy into the marine environment. And they result in, or are likely to result in, harm to living resources and marine life. Um, I won't delve into the science partly because I'm not qualified to, and others have um, better done that already. 
Um, but a broad interpretation of that definition of pollution of the marine environment is also consistent with the way UNCLOS is generally drafted and also with the way that the courts have interpreted the term. So having established that those Part 12 obligations apply to greenhouse gas emissions from ships, what does that mean for the measures that states must take in relation to greenhouse gas emissions? And importantly, what is the standard of performance of those obligations? And in respect to the standard of the obligations, I'll focus on two key aspects from our submissions, but very briefly, because the uh, matters that have already been spoken to. So first, the obligations are obligations of due diligence. So that means that state must use their best effort. That entails not only adopting appropriate rules and measures, but also exercising a certain level of vigilance in their enforcement. And it also means the standard changes over time. So it's an evolutionary standard. And that varies importantly in relation to new scientific knowledge. So like others have said, state action therefore has to be informed by the best available science. And second, that obligation of due diligence is informed by the Paris Agreement and the necessary measures the state must take must therefore be determined by reference to Paris. Um, and others have talked about harmonious interpretation and, and there's evidence in UNGLOS itself and it, international law generally that support that view. So the Paris Agreement is clearly not only relevant, but of paramount importance when it comes to questions of climate change, greenhouse gas emissions. And we submitted those, therefore, the appropriate reference for the standard of obligations relating to greenhouse gas emissions under UNCLOS. Moving on to how states look to discharge those obligations. So that, this brings us to the more specific obligation under Article 211, which applies specifically to pollution from ships. So Article 211 provides that states acting through the competent international organization or general diplomatic conference will establish international rules and standards to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment. And it's generally accepted that the IMO has competence in that regard. Um, so the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, has adopted various conventions, protocols, recommendations, including a greenhouse gas strategy in 2018, which has just been revised a couple of months ago. So that original GHG strategy was consistent with a three-degree rise. Since putting in our submission, I'm pleased to say we've seen significant improvement on that in the revised strategy, but it still remains short of where it needs to be to be 1.5 degree aligned. The ICCT puts it exceeding its share of the 1.5 degree budget by as early as 2032, albeit if they, if they hit their targets, they, they shouldn't breach the two degree limit. So we submitted that it'd be helpful, and it would be helpful both to negotiations on that strategy, which will be revisited again in 2028, 2028, and it will also be helpful to states in terms of understanding what their individual obligations are. If the tribunal clarified that states are required to adopt Paris-compliant regulation of GHG emissions from ships through the IMO or another competent organization, or in the alternative, to the extent that the IMO measures are insufficient, and states should, in accordance with their due diligence obligations, unilaterally or regionally adopt regulations to discharge their Part 12 obligations. Um, so very briefly, as I'm conscious of time, there is, there, there is then a question of jurisdiction. Um, and states can only act unilaterally in respect of matters within their jurisdiction. So our submission analyzed two types of jurisdiction under UNCLOS, uh, being flag states and port states. Flag and port states can use their jurisdictions under UNCLOS to regulate, and such regulations can then effectively capture international shipping. So taking flag states first, they're required to adopt regulations relating to vessel pollution, which have at least the same effect as internationally agreed rules, so they can, of course, go further, and they are to enforce those rules irrespective of where the violation occurs. Port states may impose conditions on entry into port that establish requirements for the prevention of pollution of the marine environment. So the practical effect of that is that port states too can um, in, enforce effectively at, on the high seas because um, ships will potentially be involuntary compliance in order to enter into the key port states. So flag and port states can adopt more stringent regulations where the IMO regulations fall short, and we argue that to discharge those Part 12 obligations, they, they should do so. So that was a very quick run through of our argument in 10 minutes. Um, 
In short, we sought to argue that UNCLOS requires states to regulate shipping emissions in line with the Paris, and if this is not met through international regulation, then states' obligations are undischarged and should be met unilaterally or regionally. And just as a final comment, in terms of what we hope for from the tribunal, I'm responding to the point that Professor John Knox made. I think we're, we're realistic that the tribunal's expertise lies in the law of the sea, and there, there may be some reluctance to want to be seen to overstep into areas such as international climate change law, where, where there are other entities of competence. But we do think it's feasible, particularly in the light of the drafting of UNCLOS and the provisions of UNCLOS, which are clearly it's clearly meant that those provisions aren't meant to be restricted to the four corners of UNCLOS, that the tribunal could adopt an integrated approach. Um, and ideally, we'd like the tribunal to confirm that the due diligence obligation to prevent, reduce and control greenhouse gas emissions, including from ships, and to elucidate the content, content of that obligation by reference to other sources of international law, including the Paris Agreement. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll, I'll pass back to Mitchell. Thanks so much for that, David. That was a really wonderful presentation and, and you know, I appreciated the maritime aesthetic of the slides as well. I thought that was excellent. Um, it did make me think about this new special rapporteur report on human rights and toxics and uh, their visit to the IMO, which I, I believe is is coming out. So, so something for our audience to watch out for. And again, conscious of time, it's now quarter past, so uh, we are running a wee bit over time, so apologies for that. But I'd like to turn now to our final and our last but not least panellist, um, uh, uh, Leah from, from Client Earth. So, so Leah, you've got the floor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. And thank you so much also to my co-panelists. It's great to be here with all of you. Um, I think as the audience will have noticed, there is substantial overlap between our submissions as they relate to the science and um, the, uh, the approach of harmonization between um, the different systems and, and obligations under international law. And so um, rather than sort of run through our entire submission, I think I will just focus on a couple of points that I wanted to highlight uh, and maybe also offer some, some thoughts on you know, why the focus on, on science and best available science um, to start off with. I mean, this is the first time that the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea will be asked to address climate change and will be um, also asked to address the science on climate change while and while the tribunal is used to, you know, receiving large um, submissions that include, um, you know, complicated scientific calculations and science. It's nonetheless really important to stress also that, you know, the scientific consensus on the human impacts um, on the climate system is unequivocal, meaning the science is clear and and there's not much sort of wiggle room to to look at the science in, in, in ways other than what has been sort of discussed and, and presented today. Um, and, and some of the scientific findings that I wanted to highlight um, and the question before the tribunal focused on um, ocean warming, acidification, and sea level rise, as, as these are some of the main sort of um, causes and concerns related to um, greenhouse gas emissions and their impact on the oceans. But um, some of the findings that we highlighted in our submissions and that are really important um, in this context as well is that um, lower emissions that the IPCC has um, you know, found and calculated that lower emissions um, increase the ability of organisms and ecosystems to adapt to the changes that are caused um, by climate change. So these are marine organisms and ecosystems. Um, and that while sea level um, rise you know, will continue even in light of, um, even if emissions were to be reduced, that deep and deep rapid and sustained greenhouse gas re uh, reductions will nonetheless slow down sea level rise. Um, and so the science tells us that we have to act urgently, that um, you know, these deep, rapid and sustained um, um, greenhouse gas emissions reductions are necessary to um, reduce some of these negative impacts of greenhouse gas emissions on the oceans. And um, just to echo um, some of the comments that were made already, this also means that states in meeting that obligation to protect the marine environment from these effects of greenhouse gas emissions um, means that they cannot rely on uncertain and high risk solutions and technologies. Rather, the science has shown that it is um, rapid greenhouse gas um, reductions that actually lead to some of those um, harms being lessened. Um, 
And that's just something that we wanted to highlight because I think it's it's um, important to acknowledge that the science shows us clear pathways um, to reducing some of those harms. Um, as some of the um, colleagues also mentioned, um, you know, state obligations are informed by due, um, due diligence and due diligence itself is not a stagnant concept. Um, it can change in light of new scientific knowledge. And so again, this is where um, the science ties into informing state action, state obligations, and the way forwards. Um, maybe one point also just to highlight again um, are the articles on state responsibility and what those say in relation to um, what, what states um, have to do when they're responsible for uh, wrongful acts, and, and that includes seizing wrongful conduct and, and bringing breaches to an end. And while I want to be clear that um, greenhouse gas um, emissions per se do not uh, at the moment constitute a wrongful conduct, they do where they are at a level where they're harmful to the marine environment. Um, and so again, this leads me back to the point of consulting the science on what measures are required of states and what levels of greenhouse gas emissions are um, considered um, to amount to harmful impacts and, and, and harmful interference with the marine environment. Um, just a couple of, of sort of final thoughts on um, rules of interpretation. Um, the colleagues have touched upon harmonization and coherence. Um, and this also um, in, in sort of, um, jurisprudence as well as academic writings, we can also find that this is especially true where subse subsequent developments took place and that, and that doesn't just uh, encompass legal developments, but also scientific scientific and technological developments, and um, which leads to the conclusion that, you know, other regimes, including the Paris Agreement, but also as we have just heard, international human rights are relevant to the interpretation of obligations under UNCLOS human rights because you know they relate to traditional fishing practices to cultural value to human health we've heard about intergener intergenerational equity um human security there's so many different aspects of international human rights that you tie in with um the law of the sea and the need to protect um the marine environment um and maybe just sort of as a um as a final concluding thought um international law and, and I think one of the things that um, we have seen in, in, in some of the systems as uh, sorry in some of the submissions to it laws is that um, it is international law is in fact a dynamic legal system um, it is ever evolving um, the special rapporteur earlier on um, gave a short overview of, of some of the developments in just the most recent years and that is why um, I joined the colleagues in um, calling not only on, on states, but also on, on the tribunal in sort of considering the most recent developments in science, but also both in, in the legal world on how other courts, other tribunals, other treaty bodies have dealt with interpreting human rights obligations, but other state obligations in light of new developments, new um, knowledge as it relates to the climate crisis um, in informing state obligations and in understanding and, and interpreting these um, conventions and obligations, many of whom were drafted at a time when no consensus on climate, on, on the climate crisis existed yet and, and um, international cooperation and so on, on the issue. And so we therefore um, look forward or we hope um, that this is only the first stepping stone in, um, as Sepp also highlighted in, in, in relation to the other advisory opinions as well. Um, thank you so much. All right, tremendous stuff there. Thank you very much for that. That was great. So we have about seven minutes left until we're scheduled to finish. So I'm just wondering if I can offer uh, any of the other panelists uh, whether they would like to kind of reflect on today's discussions. Um, we don't really appear to have questions that haven't been answered or, or already being answered in, in the chat. So so uh, Elisa, I don't know if you want to want to chime in at any point and, and just kind of reflect on discussions thus far, or if anybody else for that matter. Yeah, well, well, first of all, also just to thank all the panelists for, for reaching out to us and, and having that exchange, I think showing the areas of convergence and, and also the areas of complementarity across our submissions is really crucial. 
um, as well as seeing how they um, align and support some of the points made by the joint uh, submission by the three UN Special Rapporteurs. Um, I think we've also all been looking at what um, arguments have been made by states and other organizations. Um, I think that argument around uh, systemic interpretation is really very coming strongly across, but of course it'll be the devil is always in the details about, you know, to what extent and uh, with what scope the tribunal will be able to, to engage. Um, I think that there were two points that maybe were mentioned, but we could expand upon. I mean, one was the um, point around uh, prevention and precaution, um, which is, you know, kind of a general, prin general principles that cut across all these areas of international law. Maybe precaution might, might be considered a kind of a slightly newcomer in international human rights law, and yet really provides, I think, a crucial bridge uh, in this conversation and also to bring that engagement with the science that all of us have also um, underscored in our presentations. And, and in my mind, I'm, I'm still thinking about precaution, both in terms of that understanding of what is the relevant science, how we understand best available science and the element of, of time and, and time scale. Um, and so that conversation on children's rights and also future generations, I think is really um, important. And maybe, you know, if, if panelists wish to say more about that, I think that could be helpful uh, in concluding. Um, so I'll just throw that to the panel to see if anyone wants to comment on that, um, but other points are welcome as well. Maybe I can just add one one thought on on uh, what you just mentioned in relation to the precautionary principle and and one of the things that I um found interesting as well in in drafting our submission is that and and um you might you will all be aware of this, but um under UNCLOS, um the um the definition provides that substances or energy that are that result or are likely to result in harm. So UNCLOS itself adopts the precautionary principle in its approach to pollution. Um, and, 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 I, and I think that's A, really important to remember, but B, also is then interesting to consider uh, in light of the fact that the science itself actually establishes a clear causal link in relation to many of the points that were discussed um, today. And then at the same time, um, to also remember that where that science is not yet um, unequivocal in, in relation to the harms, the precautionary approach nonetheless has to be adopted. I mean, I guess looking at, oh, sorry, Seb, yeah, go in, go ahead. You mentioned the recent development in relation to children's rights, so maybe just <laughs> that's a plug to come back to the general comment 26 of the Child Rights Committee that was released just a, a week ago. Um, I think one one example perhaps of a potent, the synergies between the different legal frameworks is that reference um, to what uh, measures are required for states to fulfill their obligations. Uh, I discussed uh, Article 194 of UNCLOS, but we have a very similar analysis in the Child Rights um, Committee's general comment uh, that explains that actually only the measures that uh, basically do not cause additional harms are the ones that states can rely upon to meet their obligations to protect uh, children from climate-induced harms. And so I think it's just another example of these linkages in a way that's very explicit in that general comment. And maybe I can put the link uh, here. And I would just flag because um, the uh, state's interventions were mentioned already. Uh, we know that the hearings will take place next week, and I think it's very important for civil society, for uh, the legal uh, community to pay close attention to how states are portraying various arguments and to also question and expose perhaps uh, when um, states are, are quite proactively seeking to undermine, weaken the outcome and to uh, basically try to impress upon uh, the judges in Hamburg that uh, they have only an extremely restricted mandate um, because I think that provides the timing of this provides us with an opportunity to um, express our disappointment when needed uh, with such states so that uh, by the time they their uh, memorials, uh, memorandums are ready for the ICJ. Hopefully, we can see a, a more adequate uh, level of of ambition and uh, legal interpretation in in these memorandums. <laughs> 
Yeah, okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So just we're nearly at time there. So I'm just inviting any any other panelists to make a, any final statement or comment. Otherwise, we'll be able to wrap things up. Uh, Elise, I see you're answering one of the questions in, in the chat. So I'll give you the time to do that before I cut you off. But um, so yes, I don't know, David or, or, or Leah, if you want to chime in at all. Yeah, well, just, just to add to the precautionary point, I think, you know, that um, it, that is a really important aspect of this that we, we'd like to see come across from the tribunal because um, at the moment, probably the approach from the state, certainly in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, is, is a kind of a license to exploit that space up to two degrees, and that's completely contrary to the precautionary approach. It's just not a case of aiming for somewhere between 1.5 and 2 or, or treating that 2 as an upper limit. It's actually we should be... Um, with with a precautionary approach of mind, keeping below one point five. Excellent. And and Leah, would you like to add anything else, or? Um, no, maybe just to um, Seb Seb's point quickly on on sort of more practical points. Um, uh, him and I will both be in Hamburg next week, so please do also kind of follow along on different social media channels, engage. Um. And as he mentioned, you know, this is also the opportunity to follow follow along closely, see what states states are submitting um, on this. And as has also been uh, mentioned, what precedent um, or this will set in, in, in terms of state engagement for the ICJ advisory opinion as well. Excellent. OK, so just a huge um, thank you to all our panelists as well. I've really, really enjoyed today. Um, I think it's been a wonderful collaborative effort across different kind of organisations and research institutions. So so I'm really proud to have been, have been part of this. So so again, thank you all very much. Um, I will wrap this up now. Um, and again, thank you. I hope you have a good day or evening, depending on where you are in the world. So thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Metro.